Yes, I do belong to quite a lot of um, um, research groups. The one primarily is the Environmental Chemical Pollution and Health Research Unit. And a lot of the work I'll present now is the work that we do in that specific um, unit itself. Um, there's a lot of work in the Institute for Sustainable Malaria Control, and a lot of the work um, is really around finding, um, it's sort of spread into three different parts. One about the, um, the, the finding a vaccine, so some of our groups are doing those types of work. The other ones are in the environment itself, looking for drivers, mosquito populations. And then the other group that I belong to looks at what are the negative effects of some of these chemicals we are using. And then recently, um, we launched the Center for Environmental Justice in Africa at university. So that's based in public health law. And the intention is to create this space where we could do some of these types of research around what is justice. And justice is quite broadly defined. So that's not the focus of what I'm talking about now, but that is sort of how all of this work ties together. So as um, a background, I come from a physiology background, human physiology, um, but then moved on to um, in, um, looking at uh, the environment, environmental um, health in particular. So what I'll talk about, I'll talk about um, the broad definition of environmental health. What does that mean? What does it mean from a public health perspective? I'll give two examples. And um, yesterday we heard a lot about the environmental interactions as well as the social interactions. So I'll share with you the two projects that we are doing, one in a rural area. And I'm glad the first speaker really talked, talked about um, as well as, as great as, the, as it is to do it in rural areas, we also do have some other, other issues in cities. And like you mentioned yesterday, the question about water, I'll talk about water. That's primarily where we do some of our work in. Um, what are the public health environmental um, roles? Um, I thought about aligning SDGs to um, One Health and how they fit in in order to identify who are these stakeholders and role players are. And in the end, I'll sort of end with a few challenges and opportunities that I thought would, um, would enhance discussion. So we've heard a lot about environmental health, and there was a definition that was um, gave, uh, given yesterday. But really, the WHO defines it, and there's the, the definition, and it's quite narrow. It's not really an all-inclusive um, definition at all. So if we think in terms of public health, and I've sort of expanded it to um, do what we are doing, and I think this is an important aspect, as well as it's, um, and it's important that it's the natural as well as the, the, the built environment. And I'll give one example of natural, one example of built environment. But it's really these interactions between people and their environments, and how that promotes human health, animal health, and well-being. Um, and it really environmental for me encompasses this assessment and this control of all of these environmental factors. So I'll talk a lot about environmental determinants of health as well as social determinants of health and how this obviously leads, leads to diseases. So um, one of the first projects, and this is um, one that um, uh, we're almost nearing completion, but we started thinking about it is what are these, um, and we trained around climate change, what are these environmental and social determinants of health in developing this climate resilience um, strategy in terms of the community. So this area, and the point doesn't work. So this area um, that we're working in is right close to the Zimbabwean border, so Mozambique, and the red dots are where, um, where our study sites are. And ideally what we try to identify is, one, what are some of the environmental determinants of health that people either self-identify and what we can then um, obviously um, also look at, um, and as well as what are some of the social dynamics within the community. Because most of these communities, um, the Kruger Park is, so there where um, you have the study sites, Beni Matale, the Kruger Park um, gate is literally about 50 kilometers away from there. So it's really quite close, close to there. It is fenced off, so there's no interaction with the wildlife. But um, what we did, so I broke this up into the three studies that we're doing. So from a, um, a environmental monitoring point of view, um, we looked at some of the water samples within along the the river itself. So what we know is that both humans use the water as well as the cattle themselves to the also they, they drink the water too. So what we looked at was looking at any um, activity in the water to identify what are some of the, can it be, have an, an effect. Um, we screened for some of the, the pharmaceuticals and tried to quantify them and also had a look at viruses. So I'll just share briefly just two slides of the results and this is by no means an exhaustive list. But the idea behind this was if we know what contaminants are within the water sources, it makes it easier to now go back to the community to understand what are the practices around these, whether it is both for personal use, um, for the, uh, the, the animals, if we pick up any of these. Um, on the next slide, there's 
herbicides uh, is already picked up in some of the sites. So what are people using for subsistence farming as well as for the animals they're using? If that lands up in the environment, both humans are accessing the water as well as the animals are accessing the water too. So that creates a bit of a problem there. And how, how do we then address that? So I have two PhDs, one focusing on environmental determinants of health, one on the social determinants of health in the same area. And we're building on what we found in the environment itself. So the first, and this is a little bit small, I apologize. So the first, the quantitative component really is to understand what has been published before, going in and actually finding out what are some of these practices, and this is specifically around um, temperature now, and then measuring indoor temperature, but then looking at how people would adapt to this, in, uh, this environment itself. And the reason behind that is most of the water sources people are using for either for heating, for, for cooling, water's contaminated, you're actually bringing that from the environment back into the home and feeding your animals too. So that interaction is there, but understanding how that works. From the social side, um, we also need to understand what are the, the um, in terms of the resilience, what is the resilience of the community, but also understand what are these um, determinants of health in relation to climate change um, and about health literacy. So what is the level of health Literacy, because very often we have these education awareness campaigns, but they're often pitched at a level that is not really at what the community needs. So if you can make an assessment on what the health literacy needs and gaps are, it makes it easier to identify that. And then link that to um, the, the key behavior, so um, how do people behave around there, and then to look at this um, integrative community resilience framework. So this is rural. So I thought, okay, but we've done it in, in there, but let's look closer to Pretoria, where we also have uh, challenges are not exactly the same, but um, we can also have a look at there. So what I did, I partnered with um, the architecture department. We had an engineer coming on board as well. Um, so I'm from environmental health, Ida's uh, social determinants of health expert also joining. And really we want to look what is this in interaction within the city, um, looking at these living spaces environmental pollution, disease dynamics. Not all of the individuals had, um, had um, dogs or cats or animals, few had. So we were lacking on the animal health side, but this is sort of a, a starting point. So what we did is, and um, so these are all four of our respective fields, but really to map the study area, um, the engineer developed sensors for us to look at the temperature inside, outside. We had the, um, many of the CAP surveys to understand the environment, to understand the interaction with the, the animals, if there were animals, to understand the environmental pollution, as well as what some of the other gaps are. Look at the health, um, literacy of the community, measure the toxicants in the water, and have this idea of understanding what thermal comfort is, and then look at this dissemination plan. So we published this in January of this year, and talking about the first presenter about how do we look at um, you know, this um, built environment, uh, public health interaction, and um, in this context we have. And if you look at um, the diagram, point does work, right at the top, that's environmental health. And how it filters through is environmental health, social determinants of health. You have all the different precautionary principles. And what we really discussed in this particular paper is how all of these link together. What are the roles and responsibilities of public health, environmental health, social determinants, your engineers are coming in with all these um, great tools that we can use. And really in order to address some of these, these the issues that we have, we can monitor things, but we actually need to do something about it. So moving on to phase two, and here we, within the community themselves, and they're actually in the field this week, so unfortunately can't be there, but um, with the architecture department, we partner together and within these communities, and you'll see here are where we all are um, discussing with the communities, looking at different questionnaires, actually having our community meetings to share some of the results and saying, but we are finding this in the community. How can we co-create some of these interventions what would work, what would not work? What is sustainable short term, what is sustainable long term? Is it needs, is it education, is it gaps, is it skills? What exactly can that be? So the idea is to um, have this community uh, action plan. And this year and in this next couple of weeks really is to really talk about all of this. To see how we can int integrate our findings as well as recommendations 
um, and have these um, in the accountable social organizations. So a majority of the youth groups in the area have come on board. The youth have been saying they'd like to learn some of these skills. So how can we impart some of this very um, um, low level technology that can be used in the communities, as well as a look at uh, other ways we can collect more of this information, but really take that back to the community that they can um, take that up and we've partnered with the uh, local municipality. Um, once we have done all of this, to actually look at how we can improve some of the services that the community would, would actually need. So when I thought of, um, and we heard the first speaker speak about um, you know, One Health and this is a definition, where does public health really fit in, and environmental health fit in, in all of this? So thinking of, of all of that, so I've, these are just uh, some ideas, not all of the ideas. And reflecting back on the work that we have done around antimicrobial resistance, um, climate change, pollution, pollution control, all of these, these all tie in and they all, um, they all do fit in. So if you look at the definition um, that was presented really about, it's this balance between these two and how to optimize the health of animals, um, people and the ecosystem itself. But again, I like that it comes back that it is more of, it's this wider environment. You often don't think of it in terms of a wider environment. So then I thought, okay, and we, um, ha, um, this was already presented before, and I thought about who are these stakeholders and, and the role players. We've now worked with quite a lot of people as far as monitoring is concerned, a lot of people that as far as the environment or the, the four minutes, so social side is concerned. So then I thought, okay, um, let's look at this in terms of the SDGs. So I looked at the, I looked at looking at all of these, um, the spheres like we uh, we called it, and you know we have uh, ecotox, which most of my work was in environmental medicine. One else really in the middle, but we think of stakeholders. We often forget that we have some of these targets already. There are some SDGs already, but we don't really think of them in terms of putting them together. So you'll see public health is right here, and human health at the bottom with all those SDGs, but technically public health is actually involved in everything, as well as climate change. So in thinking in terms of who these role players are, changing the narrative slightly and saying, but we're not reinventing anything, we just need to get the right people in the ta on, uh, at the same table that are actually doing all of these work and trying to get them to, to, work, to work together. So then I thought, okay, um, if these are the, the role players, how do I pick out just a few and what are some of the recommendations? So these are really in terms of um, my suggestion really for um, one of the stakeholders we have. We know it's the government and they sort of um, have the influence that they have on internal organizations, academic institutions. We also play quite a big role in terms of funding because we are limited by the funding that we receive and the guidelines with the funding itself. If we don't have that, we really can't do all of the work with collaborative partners, the partnerships, the civil society, um, uh, et cetera. I think we've talked a lot about that. So then um, in, to wrap it up, I sort of thought, okay, how do we then, and I th one of the things was, as far as environmental health is concerned, how do you really in in institutionalize this? So um, here are just a few ideas as I was thinking about them, putting them down, and some already exist in some way or form, but they may not be as, um, as operational as we would like them to be. I um, mean, we do have some of the, the committees that work together, but not as, um, as efficient as what they, they should be doing. So things around policy development legislation, things around institutional arrangements, um, whether it's this cross-sector environmental health committees, around capacity development, we've seen a lot on environmental health education, and I presented another conference two weeks ago about how do we use some of these results we have and actually teach environmental health practitioners, for example, how, because they are the ones going out into the field. Um, around community engagement, public awareness, um, and then lastly about international cooperation, monitor evaluation, and learning. Because if we don't develop, the indicator's already there as far as the SGs is concerned, but sometimes we need to take that together and we, in reporting, can actually say we are making progress, yes or no. And just, thank you very much. Thank you.